Welcome back to Behind the Wheel. Today, join me on the wrong side of the road, put on your tweed jacket and your flat cap and cancel your dentist appointments, because this, folks, is England. And this is in a 1973 Lotus Elan, which is French for gathering momentum. Now, if you don't know why most Lotus cars have a name that starts with an E, don't worry. I don't either, and I'm doing just fine. What I do know, however, is that driving this car on the twisty roads of the British Midlands is an absolute delight. And if you don't trust me, the chap who designed and built the McLaren F1 said that his only regret was that the F1 didn't handle quite as well as the Elan. And in my book, that's no small praise. That's no small praise at all. Now, Lotus cars have always been in a bit of a class of their own. And if you want to understand what makes a Lotus a Lotus, you have to understand the mind of the man who designed them. You have to understand the mind of one Colin Chapel. In 1948, Chapman left the Royal Air Force to pursue his true passion, motor racing. And very quickly, he demonstrated his ability to think outside the box, using his limited resources to build engines that outperformed his competitors. Until, that is, the rules were altered to ban his specific modifications. This would set a trend that would follow him for most of his career. The most famous of Chapman's innovations was the utilization in Formula 1 of Venturi tunnels to create a grand effect that would suck the car to the road, allowing it to corner at much higher speeds than other cars. Needless to say, the grand effect was banned by the FIA for, let's say, debatable reasons. That is, until it was reintroduced to F1 in 2022, of course. But if there is one idea that perfectly embodies Chapman's engineering philosophy, it's this. Adding power makes you faster on the straights. Subtracting weight makes you faster everywhere. In other words, simplify, then add lightness. Enter the Lotus Elan. Now, the Elan was the first Lotus to be built with a steel backbone chassis and a fiberglass body to save weight. And the results were dramatic with a curb weight of just 680 kilograms, which is about the same as a soap bubble. But it didn't stop there. In 1962, the car had a twin cam engine that was doing many clever things, disc brakes all around, and an independent suspension system. And the result of all these things combined is excellent performance. And the handling, it might as well be made of pure telepathy. And that creates a bit of a problem. You see, England has one of the best road networks for petrol heads like you and me. It is made of a seemingly endless series of winding roads, banked corners, hairpins, climbs and descents. It really seems to be designed for the car enthusiast to go out for a nice drive on a Sunday afternoon. What's the problem with this picture? I can hear you wonder. Well, that's the thing. England being England, all these beautiful roads are plagued with more potholes than you will find spots on a teenager's forehead. And there are edges everywhere, so you can never really see what's coming around the corner, and then you have to drive 10 miles an hour. It really shouldn't be that hard to find a good driving road in this beautiful country. But you know what? Today, we've managed just fine. But let's get back to the car. The most observant of viewers will have noticed that this is not just any Elan. This is a Plus 2 S130, the family man's Elan, with two extra small seats in the back for children. Now that makes perfect sense, of course. Lotus's motto being simplify them add lightness. Chapman had to ask his engineers to make a version of the car that was just a little bit more complicated 
and a little bit heavier. But from where I'm sitting, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. This thing just drives beautifully. And to make up for the gain in weight and dimensions, the car was fitted with an upgraded 1.6 litre big valve engine that is good for 126 horsepower. And that's a 0 to 60 in less than eight seconds and a top speed of 120 miles per hour. And that's from 50 years ago. That's not too shabby, is it? about the design. There really isn't that much to say because any idiot could see that this is a thing of beauty. But what I really want to talk about is the pop-up headlights. I don't know what it is about those things, but they seem to speak to every man's inner eight-year-old. Those and retractable roofs are really the closest things you can get to owning a transformer. And I think it's a shame that they have all but disappeared in the past 20 years or so. And worse, the reason is that it is almost impossible to design pop-up headlights in compliance with safety regulations, especially for pedestrians. I don't know about you, but if a few thousand broken shins every year are the price to pay for the return of those beautiful gizmos, that is a sacrifice that I, for one, am willing to make. Now, unfortunately, and as it is always the case when I get to drive those classic cars, my time with the Elan is coming to an end. And as always, it is a little bit of a heartbreak. But the story of Lotus itself is a little bit of a heartbreak. You see that simply aren't that many car brands that have such a strong identity and more importantly, that are so true to their founder's vision. Currently, I can think of maybe Pagani, Rymac, Koenigsegg, and that's what makes the loss of Colin Chapman even more tragic because he was a brilliant engineer and businessman. Who knows what kind of innovative ideas they would have come up with had he not died at the early age of 54 in 1982. Nowadays, Lotus is mostly a Chinese-owned brand and that doesn't really scream innovation, does it? So, potholes or not, I am going to spend the next few hours behind the wheel of this true British classic. This one is for England. And you know what? Just for the hell of it. Oh, 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 oh,